General questions of philosophy of science can be broadly divided into three subsections. Firstly, there are general questions of philosophy of science which are addressed in the context of biology. Secondly, there is the analysis of conceptual issues within biology. And thirdly, there are questions of general philosophical interest that, are, that can be studied by appealing to biology. Among those questions are, for instance, the question about how to define life, uh, or bioethical questions about uh, to which extent should uh, genetic modification be allowed, or epistemological questions about how is knowledge acquired in different areas of biology. In what follows, I will give a brief overview of the main questions that arise uh, in the context of philosophy of biology. After that, I will give an overview of the relevance of philosophy of biology, firstly, for the discipline of biological science, and secondly, for the more general domains of life. Uh, let's first start with the general questions of philosophy of science that are addressed uh, in the context of biology. Among those questions are, for instance, the question about which is the nature of evidence and explanation in biology, other something like universally applicable laws of nature in biology, and uh, also whether the claims of biology can be reduced to the claims of other disciplines such as chemistry and physics. All these questions are also related to the question about how similar is biology to chemistry and physics. At least by common knowledge, classical physics is characterized by its main task, uh, tasks of discovering universally applicable strictly deterministic laws of nature and testing hypotheses by experiments. However, according to many philosophers of biology, there are no, no such things as universal laws of nature in biology. Ernst Meyer, has, for instance, has claimed that bio biology is based on principles which are less strict than laws of nature. According to him, biolog biology is a unique science by virtue of conceptions that allow for biological explanations. Paleontologist Niles Ildrich uh, described biology as being based on patterns which are law-like regularities and they consist of repeated schemes of events. The notion of pattern also characterizes biology as a historical science. The nature of study subjects in biology also influences the choice of uh, evidence gathering for testing hypotheses in biology. For instance, when making claims about the behavior of living organisms, Observing them in the natural habitat might be preferred to experiments where some isolated variables are manipulated in order to test hypotheses about them. Now the question of reductionism. In general terms, the question of reductionism is, in biology is about whether the properties, concepts, methods or explanations in biology can be deduced from the properties, concepts explanations or methods from chemistry and physics. According to reductionism, higher level biological processes do reduce to the, to the process of physics and chemi chemistry. For instance, the biological process of respiration can be explained as a biochemical process involving oxygen and dioxide. According to the holist view, Lower level biological processes must be understood in the context of the living organism in which they take place. Similarly, individual organisms must be understood in the context of their ecosystem and reducing ecosystem uh, to its part would be less effective at explaining the overall behavior. Over the past decades, the question about reductionism in biology is mostly concentrated on the question about whether classical Mendelian genetics can be reduced to molecular genetics and biochemistry. Let's now move on to the question that are characteristic of philosophy of biology more specifically. Among the very major ones are the questions of systematic biology, such as the problem of species. The problem of species is mostly concerned with the um, with different species concepts and their application. 
At first glance, the problem, problem of species might look as a pseudo problem. Shouldn't we just go and discover species that are out there in nature? However, at a closer look, things start to appear more complicated. For instance, there are no spe uh, criteria of species membership that would unproblematically cover the whole natural diversity. Secondly, different species concepts might lead to different results and different classifications. The best known is the biological species concept, according to which a species is a rep reproductively isolated community. That means a species is a group of organisms that can freely interbreed with each other and produce fertile offspring and that cannot breed with, with members of other species. There are several problems with biological species concept though. Firstly, it doesn't apply to asexually reproducing organisms. It means it is very limited, whereas the majority of species in the living world are asexual. Secondly, there are problems with defining reproductive isolation. Firstly, there is a phenomenon of hybridization, which means that organisms which are classified into belonging to different species actually can hybridize each other. That means produce fertile offspring. Secondly, there are organisms which are commonly classified into belonging to the same species that still do not reproduce, be it due to anatomical constraints or geographical distances. And the second main species concept is an ecological species concept according to which a species is a population occupying the same ecological niche or competing for the same ecological resources. The problem with this species concept is that it is not always easy to determine a degree to which two or more species are competing ecologically. The third main species concept is a phylogenetic species concept, according to which a species is a segment of a phylogenetic tree between two speciation events, between speciation and extinction. The problem is that this species concept depends on other species concepts for determining when the speciation event has occurred. And by this, this species concept also inherits the problems of other species concepts. Fourthly, there is the phenetic species concept according to which a species is a group of phenotypically similar organisms. The problem with this species concept is that two organisms can be similar or different in infinitely many ways. So, deciding which similarity should underlie species membership might be somewhat arbitrary. In addition to choosing between different species concepts, there are also other questions related to the notion of species. For instance, are they real or are they mere human conventions? Secondly, should we accept the plurality of species concept and the conflicting classifications deriving from them? And also, some authors have claimed that species are not types of organisms in the same way as chemical elements are types of matter. Instead, they are something like historical particles, something like nations. This also leads us back to the claim according to which there are no universally applicable laws of nature in bio biology that would apply everywhere and at every time point. Among the main conceptual issues of philosophy of biology are the questions about the definition of a gene. These questions are usually asked in the context of classical and molecular genetics and one of the relevant questions is about whether the former can be reduced to the latter. According to the classical genetics, a gene is a hereditary factor tied to a particular simple feature or character. In the context of molecular biology, a gene is commonly seen as a sequence of DNA or RNA that codes for a molecule that has a function. According to the anti-reductionist consensus, there is no clean mapping of Mendelian kinds to any molecular kinds and that according to this consensus, the new and old theory represent complementary and mutually illuminating, illuminating ways of seeing the same physical processes. Now we'll, I will say 
a few more words about one main question, the question about the units of selection. This question asks what are selected, genes, single organisms, populations or the whole species? If you think about the traditional view of evolution by natural selection, we usually think of sing single organisms as units of selection. Think about a herd of zebras, for instance, some being faster than others. Faster zebras are more successful at escaping predators and hence more offspring. As a result, we get a change in the average moving speed of zebras over time, a single organism being the unit of selection and also the bearer of the property being selected for. However, some biological phenomena, such as biological altruism, might make us look for the units of selection on other, bio other levels as well. Biologically altruistic behavior benefits other organisms at a cost to itself, the costs and benefits being measured in terms of reproductive fitness or expected number of offspring. Only one example of this sort of behavior is alarming your group about the predator and getting killed as a result, whereas the group will be saved. If the natural selected selection acted only on organismic level, the trait of altruism would disappear from the population as its bearers would be in danger of being prematurely killed before having a chance of reproducing. Some explanations for why altruism has pre preserved in a population have appealed to the notion of group selection. According to this notion, the group which involves altruists is on the whole evolutionarily more successful than the group without altruists, even if altruistic traits might decrease the fitness of a single individual possessing them. Why altruistic genes have preserved in a population has also sometimes been explained by the notion of kin selection, that is a tendency to be more altruistic towards one's relatives with a similar genetic makeup. As one of the responses to the altruism problem, Richard Dawkins has come up with the so-called selfish gene view or genes eye view. According to this view, genes are the ultimate levels of selection, organisms only being their survival machines. If this view were true, it would help to explain why the altruism genes are favored by natural selection so long as the cost to the altruistic single organisms is offset by a sufficiently closely related relatives who are also likely to possess the so-called altruism genes. Having given an overview of only a fraction of the big questions in philosophy of biology, what can we say about the actual relevance of philosophy of biology for the biological science? Whereas it can be accepted that the biologists can undertake philosophy of biology, it has sometimes been doubted whether philosophy of biology actually has any relevance for so-called biology making. However, as David Hull has claimed, biologists have been amazingly rece receptive to philosophy. One of the main tasks of philosophy of science, as is with the philosophy of in general, is to help scientists to clearly formulate their questions. One of the main components of this formulation is the philosoph philosophical analysis of the main concept, concepts of biological language. Concepts such as life, purpose, progress, complexity, genetic program, adaptation and so on. Another main aspect is pursuing the detection, analysis and sometimes providing solutions to the methodological and theoretical problems. As Emanuela Sorelli has pointed out, there are two traditional areas of biology where philosophy of biology has actively contributed. The first is systematic, systematic biology, which deals with classifying organisms and detecting natural groups in order to uh, search for and create order in the living world. This task is closely related to the species problem that was already characterized before. The second task is elaborating the abstract description of natural selection by based on the concepts of variation, fitness and heritability. A classical abstract description was elaborated by Richard Leventin 
its analysis and criticism are closely related to the questions about units of selection and genes I view that were already characterized already. When asking about the relevance of philosophy of biology for the biological science, it also has to be noted that there is no clear borderline between philosophers of biology and theoretical biologists. Sometimes even big visionaries such as Charles Darwin himself have been characterized more as philosophers of biology than pure biologists, but this distinction is sometimes difficult to make. One of the tasks of philosophy of biology is to introduce biological phenomena to the people outside biological sciences such by discovering, revealing and correcting common misconceptions about biological phenomena. These misconceptions involve essentialist pictures, biological species or human groups, genetic determinism, or overly adaptationist progressive view of evolution by natural selection, to mention just a few. Essentialist picture of biological species or human groups makes people assume that all the members of these groups possess some common genetic essential properties that inevitably make animals or humans possess the traits characteristic of their kind. The view that overly relies on behavior or other properties being controlled by genes is called genetic determinism. In reality, there are no genetic properties that all and only the members of a species would share, and the species membership in modern biology is more often characterized by relational properties between species members, such as parent-offspring relations. What I mean by overly adaptationist view is the assumption according to which all the properties that we have are optimal solutions that are favored by natural selection. In reality, natural selection is a dynamic process leading to the possession of traits that can at best be only temporarily more or less optimal depending on the selective pressures that an organism is faced with that moment of time. We do possess organs such as appendix that have allegedly lost their formerly adaptive function. On the other hand, we might possess some traits which might not be selectively more advantageous than their hypothetical alternatives. For instance, can we say that having five fingers is actually more advantageous than possessing four or six fingers? However, distinguishing between advantageous and non-advantageous traits is not always straightforward and can sometimes be more of a speculation than based on real scientific facts. Finally, I will say a few words about social relevance of philosophy of biology. One of its tasks is critically evaluating the biological arguments that underlie classifying stereotyping and treating people belonging to different human groups. It also contributes to the social and political debates about medicine, family planning, agriculture and ecology by asking questions such as whether and up to when should be abortion permitted, the answer depending on the definition of life and its beginning, whether and to which extent should genetic modification of humans, animals, crop, etc. be allowed, or which groups of organisms should be classified as species, which only subspecies, etc. So we have reached the end of this mini-lecture, in which I have attempted to give an introduction of philosophy of biology in the hope that it has helped you closer to understanding its main problems and relevance within biological science and outside it.